Hi there, everyone. Welcome. My name is JG. I am the conference meetings associate here, and I'm so glad to have you all in this session. I'm going to start us off with APAP's land acknowledgement, which I'm going to put into the chat right now, and which I will also be reading from. So APAP is located in our nation's capital in Washington, D.C., on the ancestral lands of the Piscataway and the Anacostan people who have stewarded this land throughout the generations. I would like to pay my respect to the Piscataway and Anacostan elders, both past and present. I myself am located in Boston, Massachusetts, and want to pay my homage to the Massachusetts Wapana sorry, Wampanoag and Nipmuc peoples. And I encourage you to put into the chat as well the ancestral lands in which you are currently upon. Um, I'm going to also put into the chat some group expectations about this conversation we're about to have, and I'm going to pass it over to my wonderful colleague, Krista. Thanks, JG. Hi, everybody. Um, I, it's good to see you again. So many of you were in the earlier uh, session, so glad you are able to join us in this one. I'm super excited about uh, this session because it's, it's like our past session. It's the beginning of a series of conversations around critical issues impacting the field. And this one is around our workforce uh, development, the state of our workforce, and what are the challenges and issues that we're grappling with. And, and, and more so than that, how do we sort of solve them and work together to identify and solve those? So um, thank you for joining us here for that, uh, for the preliminary discussion that um, we'll, we'll use today to craft some other conversations, both at conference and afterwards. Um, and I'm super happy to um, introduce some amazing colleagues that we've been so privileged to work with, David McGraw and Meg Friedman, who were the co-authors of Return to the Stage study uh, that we collaborated with them um, on uh, back in September to share kind of what they learned um, in how the, the pandemic has impacted our field and the people that are working in it. Um, and frankly, that, that, that study inspired this series of conversations. So um, we're so happy to have uh, Meg and David here and our wonderful panel who will int introduce themselves. So um, Meg and David, uh, take it away and thank you for leading us and thank you all the panelists for being here. Thank you, Krista. And we're so, we're simply overjoyed to be here um, sharing this, uh, maybe not happy, but important information um, with the APAP family and um, sitting at the table with um, the whole bunch of folks on this call. Uh, my name is Meg Friedman. I'm a white woman of Jewish heritage and short stature um, with mostly gray hair wearing glasses. I'm wearing a pink turtleneck and a gray vest. And there's a blurry background behind me um, because it's kind of a mess otherwise. Um, I'm joining you from uh, the land now known as New Haven, Connecticut, the ancestral home of the Quinnipiac people. I use she, her pronouns. And in addition to being a co-author of Return to the Stage with David McGraw, I'm a consultant and knowledge manager at AMS Planning and Research. Now I'll pass it to Brooke. Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Brooke Horsch. I use she, her pronouns and I am located in Salt Lake City, which is the traditional and ancestral homelands of the Shoshone Paiute, Goshute, and Ute tribes. Uh, I am with Utah Presents, which is a campus-based arts presenting organization. And I am also a middle-aged white woman with a whole lot of silver hair that the overhead light in my office, which is my background, reflects off of um, a little distractingly. So I apologize for that. Uh, I'm wearing a green sweater and a yellow shirt. Uh, and I have my hair tucked up so it looks short, but it's not. And I think I'm passing it to Shelly. Yes. Um, hi, everyone. It's great to see so many of you again. Uh, I'm Shelly Kiala. I'm the uh, executive director of the International Festival of Arts and Ideas uh, in New Haven, Connecticut. I'm on the traditional lands along with Meg of the Quinnipiac people. Uh, now it's known as New Haven. And I am a white woman. I have blonde hair that's shoulder length. I'm wearing red lipstick, a yellow shirt and I have a green plant and yellow and green art in my background. Um, I use she, her, hers pronouns, and I will pass it to Laura. 
Hello, everyone. It's so great to be together for this virtual moment. I'm Laura Sweet. I'm the Vice President and Chief Operating Officer for Des Moines Performing Arts here in Des Moines, Iowa. I use the pronouns she and her. I'm a white woman in my early 50s with medium length brown hair. Uh, I'm wearing a red sweater and behind me you see tons of artwork and memorabilia from uh, previous uh, engagements, including some times spent with Shelley and Brooke in Minnesota. Uh, I acknowledge I'm on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded lands of the Iowa people. We have our respect and uh, our gratitude to their elders, the past and present, as well as future generations. And I think now I will pass it over to Dave. Hello, everyone. Uh, so I'm David McGraw, and as Meg mentioned, I'm the other co-author of Return to the Stage. I am also a professor in arts administration at Elon University, which occupies the land of the Atchashir, the Catawba, Eno, Okanichi, Saponi, Shikori, and Sisapaha peoples. I use he, him pronouns. I'm an older white male uh, with graying hair, glasses, goatee, uh, stereotypical college professor, so I have the obligatory bookcase in my background. Uh, let us go on to some of our uh, quick slides as we kind of set out the framework for today. So the performing arts are, as a field is experiencing a workplace reckoning on many levels. Hiring and retaining staff, uh, empowering a new generation of leadership that is more representative of our communities, and rethinking long-time workplace balance expectations abound. Today, we will hear from our colleagues how they're innovating and developing new workplace strategies and using creative problem solving to better reflect shifts in values for workers. As Krista said, we also want to use today's session to get a head start on the January conference. Uh, I leave the APAP conference sessions energized, but I'm always wanting to learn more about or, or discuss further a topic that we've just finished. So we're going to have an opportunity at the end of today's session to suggest and to upvote ideas that can be expanded upon at the conference. So let's get started with some data uh, about the performing arts as a sector. And I suspect this will likely confirm what we as individuals have been experiencing throughout the pandemic. Return to the Stage is a national study that uh, Meg Friedman and I conducted in three short waves over a one year period with over 5,000 participants and a broad range of geography, years working in the field, age, race, gender, education levels, and union affiliations. Participation was open to anyone who worked or volunteered in the performing arts in the United States from March 2019 through March 2020. Now, there have been many excellent uh, studies about the economic impact of the pandemic on organizations, but we wanted to examine the impact on individuals and how we in the performing arts are responding. So uh, we can go to the next. Uh, you can read about these rapid response reports at returntothestage.com, um, but we wanna focus on analysis that was not part of those original reports. So we explored a, a bunch of different categories of questions um, in broad buckets. These are them. Um, and as David shared, we chose not to probe detailed losses of, of income frankly, in, in favor of minimizing trauma and recognizing where our own um, guardrails existed. Our questions instead focused on the human dimension, like how people are coping and why. Um, and the hypothesis that we started with was that this workforce is uniquely talented at thriving in uncertain times. And we decided to look at lived experience, both over the long term and in the right now in each wave of the study. So today's conversation builds on that and it uncovers a major shift in values. Now, if, if you happen to already have seen the September conversation um, with Krista and the Actors Fund, National Sawdust, and, um, and organizational development consultant, Kim Dye, this may look familiar. Um, and we'll drop a link to the recording in the chat if you haven't already, David. Um, you know, but rather than retread this information, we want to peer deeper into how people are innovating right now, and particularly what questions are being answered in specific creative ways around responding to a shift in values, a shift in priorities, a shift in workers' needs, workers very, very broadly defined. Um, so we'll spend the next handful of slides framing questions and then 
turn off the screen share and hand the mic to our wonderful panelists. You know, one of the startling finds from the July 2020 wave was a significant shift in priorities as performing arts workers uh, return this summer. The bar graph that you see there on the left shows the change in percentages since the start of the pandemic. The full percentages are listed in the chart on the right. So as you can see, salary is now a bigger factor than it was pre-COVID in terms of listing of priorities. But the largest shift is in worker focus has been in the work-life balance policies. In contrast, prior to COVID, we placed a lot of emphasis on the connections with others. Maybe it was loyalty to a team, maybe it was a desire to work with certain individuals or having recognition of working with celebrities. That priority, people I'm with, has plummeted, being largely replaced with an increased focus on salaries and work-life balance. Um, I, I win the unmute yourself prize. Um, so this, this of course is an interesting lens, but we wanted to go deeper for this conversation so that we can keep, um, keep understanding our workforce with as much nuance and sensitivity as possible. Um, and we decided to add a new lens as we approached today's conversation. Um, just the top line analysis can't get at the enormous diversity of people, occupations, lived experiences in this industry. So we looked at the data according to whether in a respondent's primary occupation, they would reasonably be expected to supervise other people. And we came up with a crude but carefully smell tested assertion based on both the occupations that we presented to respondents in the survey and a number of occupations that folks wrote in. Uh, we know it's not perfect, but we're, we're fairly confident that this way of organizing occupations by supervisory responsibility helps shine a light on where we're seeing particular strengths or sensitivities in the current time. Um, and of course, if you have a question or a disagreement with how we've organized this, we'd love to see it in the chat. Um, so looking at this in terms of non-supervisors, supervisors, and everybody, um, we can see that salary was always important with over a third of respondents saying it was a personal success metric before COVID. It's grown in importance with supervisors and non-supervisors alike saying it's a top priority as they return to work. However, the amount it's grown in importance is really different. For non-supervisors, the shift is about 22%, whereas for supervisors, the jump is nearly 30%. And to us, this suggests a, a new and, and keen sense of the personal responsibilities and even sacrifices that supervisors make and the responsibility they hold for others physical, social, emotional, and professional safety. Um, now for, for the math wonks, if you're wondering how we get 73% of all respondents saying salary is a top priority going forward, um, that number, that percentage includes people who didn't actually assert a primary occupation in a way that we could code for management responsibility. Um, so we can, we, we've had a wonderful conversation about our working papers. Uh, moving one section to the right, we see that the salary shift is also tied to revised values around work-life balance. Uh, while relatively few respondents said that this was a pre-COVID success metric, half or more say it's a top priority now. And again, the greatest leap is among supervisors whose prioritization of this consideration more than tripled. And moving to the third chunk of this chart, we were actually surprised at how respondents are rethinking the social elements of the workplace. We see small variances in how respondents used to prioritize the people they were around and an astonishingly tight pattern in how attitudes had shifted by July, 2021. Um, as people come back, we'll be of course paying very close attention to how these priorities continue to evolve. And this brings us to our questions today. Um, we'll, we'll put the questions directly in the chat so that we can stop the screen share and see everyone's faces a little more. Um, and please, as we talk, use the chat to add more questions, ideas, share resources. Um, you know, we're 
we're emphasizing, of course, that this is um, equal parts formal session and brainstorming. So with that, here we go. And maybe if we could start things off with, uh, Laura, do you wanna talk about this first question? Um, that we sent to you all of like three hours in advance. You bet, you bet. No, actually it's such an informative and interesting thing to think through. And I put on a lens of sort of a human, a traditional human resources lens or background. And I think what we're seeing here in the Midwest is uh, really holds true with much of what you found in your, in your research. Uh, from, in terms of value shift, we've certainly seen an interest in an increase in flexibility. I think that flexibility manifests in things uh, like we have directly changes to how we're handling flexibility. We're looking at technology different, we're also thinking of course about safety different in terms of physical spaces. Uh, and we've done some things, tangible things uh, to what we're offering in terms of benefits, like we're doing unlimited PTO so people uh, that our employees can think through the best for them in terms of their work balance and their balance between uh, being on the job and being away from the job. I think in terms of other value shifts, I'll just share a couple more. Uh, there's certainly been a shift uh, as we've evolved with our staffing to listening to new voices. Uh, equity, diversity, inclusion has never been more important. It's always been an important thing to our industry and our organization individually, uh, but we're certainly focused on that as we reanimate our venues. Uh, and that collaboration piece in terms of what you're finding, I do think that no matter what, as we move forward, we're going to have to think specifically about collaboration. And in terms of the people we're with, I think that is our space, it's also our broader community. To that end, here in Des Moines, we have hired a few new people and new roles like community engagement and we have community equity task force that we're working with regularly. So those are sort of some of the shifts that we're seeing here in the Midwest as we, we think about that information you've shared. Great, and other folks, other observations, um, whether panelists or any of the 99 folks we have on the call right now, uh, again, kind of thinking over the question of, you know, how have you seen, have you seen a value shift uh, and how is your organization adapting to that? Yeah, Brooke, do you want to continue? Yeah, I'll just um, add in that as we've replaced a number of positions that the people who were in them pre-pandemic um, left during the shutdown and during their either full furlough or reduced hours situation, one of the things that we're experiencing is that we've had much smaller applicant pools for, for rehiring those positions, but the applicant pools have changed, the people that are applying have changed. And we've had to um, rethink about what we think or what we have previously used to evaluate whether they're qualified enough and really expanded uh, our definitions of what makes them qualified. And, and that then of course has led to us having a group of new employees that are exciting in many ways because they're bringing different experiences to uh, their position in the arts. Maybe they didn't have a lot of arts experience previously, but they're also far more interested in professional development. And so, you know, in the time that we've been reopened with these new staff members, I've noticed a lot more investment from the team in talking about larger issues. And so that's a value shift that I, I don't think I anticipated um, as we replace staff coming back. Could we maybe kick this out to everyone? Uh, if you don't mind using um, Zoom, there's the reactions with the thumbs up. If you're in a position where you've been hiring uh, or interviewing uh, new uh, employees. Have you seen that shift that Brooke just mentioned in terms of qualifications? Or are you re-envisioning the qualification requirements for positions? Just to see if, how, if this is um, widespread. So just a thumbs up if you're experiencing that right now. I'm jumping between different screens here. So great, quite a few people. Other responses to that, or um, I don't know, we have a question here too. Um, Brooke, when you say the applicant pool has changed, how have, are there specific examples or is it, you said that you've seen smaller um, number of applicants for some positions. How else has there been changes? Yeah, I was just typing the response, but I wasn't quick enough. So um, 
people, as I referenced, a lot more uh, applicants who don't have direct performing arts experience. So they hadn't worked, you know, maybe they had gotten one or a degree in years past in an arts discipline, but they hadn't necessarily worked uh, in an arts organization to date. Um, you know, and, and I think that it wasn't that they were all fresh out of school. It's really more that when they entered the workforce, there wasn't a lot of opportunity at a living wage in arts disciplines. So they were doing other things. And, and, and then the other thing I think, and I don't know if this is just unique to us, but our applicant pools, although small, were willing to self-identify uh, in their applica application materials in ways that I hadn't really seen before. So a lot more folks uh, self-identifying as transgender. Um, and that really helped us hire with more, with more intent around diversifying our team. Um, in, and in the past, we wouldn't have necessarily had them do that in their application materials. So it would have, it made the process of, of that intentional hiring it more difficult. It's interesting because from a university perspective, we've also already seen that we've had two graduation years, 2020, 2021, where folks did not see immediate job openings just because of the pandemic. And many that had been pursuing a path in the arts went in a different direction. Mm -hmm. um, and so are we going to see this kind of play down the, the pipeline, as it were, in terms of careers? I'd like to break in um, and ask if our, our colleagues on the call who are agents or managers, um, if you can open your mic or pop a note in the chat describing your experience in this space. Um, you know, you, you occupy a particular space in the sector and you know, I, candidly, I'm just really curious. Okay, you're typing frantically, take your time. And we're getting a lot of great responses in chat. Um, I think Aisha sure. mentioned before that, you know, she's getting some candidates from other arts organizations because there is such um, kind of, uh, I don't know best how to describe it technically, but just this flux in, uh, people moving to different organizations. And so what does that mean? And what is, as I usually put it, there's also the long term of does she, can she offer the salaries to keep folks or are we going to continue to see um, this revolving uh, positions? So I'm seeing a number of comments in the chat, smaller applicant pools with less, less arts experience from Gretchen, um, Michael has a question about what change to attract non-traditional applicants apart from salary. Um, and Teresa makes a really great observation about her experience. Um, I think I'm using the right pronouns, uh, saying that you didn't have a single qualified applicant for a full-time office-based job, even after adjusting the qualification thresholds. But when you reorganize the job into part-time, two part-time hybrid positions, um, the, the applications improved considerably. But it sounds like that's a potential answer to some of the questions that we're, we may be starting to re fundamentally reimagine what a job is and how the different chunks of it are distributed across individuals. That might, oh, sorry, Krista, yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to um, raise up one of our colleagues in Michigan um, who shared that uh, when they were hiring, they had not done a lot of virtual um, hires before the pandemic, and they found that their pool was so much more diverse what they did actually um, decide to make it hybrid or virtual or um, um, split among different people. So I just wanted to underscore that, um, that point because they're not here, but they wanted to share that as uh, they sent me an email about that. This also might be a good transition into that second question, although we're nowhere near done with the first, but you know, not just the folks that we are looking to hire, but our continuing uh, or returning staff and what are, how are they responding to these changes? Um, are they leading the change? Um, and maybe for this one, Shelly, do you mind kind of starting this discussion? Sure. Um, I might build off of uh, some of what's been said already and also 
wind around. So um, feel free to draw me back in if I'm getting off topic, David. Um, so I started as, as the executive director of the festival in the middle of the pandemic. I started a little over a year ago. Um, so I had the gift of everything was different already. And um, there was a little bit less, I think there was an expectation for change. There was an appetite for change that was kind of coming already with the festival and the pandemic provided a, a, a context for that to happen without a lot of pushback. Um, I, was, I will say that the, one of the main reasons, uh, one of the main challenges that the festival had had is that the majority of the full-time year round staff was white, um, 13 out of 14. And there was a large uh, folks, there were a large number of folks that were hired in temporary positions that, and part-time positions that were people of color self-identified as BIPOC. And the city that I am in, New Haven, that's not reflected with the demographics here. So we knew that one of the first, I knew one of the first things we had to do was to shift that and be more reflective of the community. Um, so a few, I'll just share a few strategies that we used and how those were um, received. Uh, the first thing that I heard from folks was they wanted they wanted salary to be transparent, and so um, they wanted it included in the postings. And I knew that as soon as we started including it in the postings, everyone who was already on staff would say, "Great, where do I? Where's mine? I want to see where everyone is." <laughs> so I had to get ready for that conversation pretty quickly. Um, we did a salary study. We um, benchmarked wages based on data. I had a um, uh, someone that was working at, in the administrative and finance position that drove this, looked at um, our, how, what our colleagues have been doing, used a lot of the work NIFA has done. NIFA has done a lot of work on this to benchmark. And we came up with salary bands that were based on title um, that we applied across the organization. We first brought everyone up if they were below the band to be in the band and then rolled out the wage bands to everyone so they could see it at the same time that we were posting wage bands on all of our job descriptions. That has helped us retain staff um, during this time. And it, so we bumped a lot of people up. We just made the commitment to do it um, and then got really transparent with it. We also increased the number of full-time year-round staff. So we didn't have as many people coming on and leaving and coming on and leaving so that they could get benefits, they could have job security. And um, we rewrote all of our job descriptions. Uh, Brooke, you were talking about like how to, name what you actually need um, on the job. And so we included um, bilingualism in Spanish as a, a desired qualification because so much of the city here is Spanish speaking. We included the ability to interact with um, culturally diverse communities and named the communities in New Haven that are uh, um, large part portions of our community as the communities that you needed to have demonstrated ex experience working positively with, not just a talking point about it, but talk to me about how you've done this work um, primarily being African American and, and Latinx communities. And, um, and then we also uh, implemented a work from home policy um, during the pandemic, clearly everyone was working remotely, but upon coming back to two out of the five days of the work week, um, we're asking people to be in the office and the other three they're working from home. And we made a really intentional shift towards, we're not managing to desk time, we're managing to work. And that's something that we trained all of the hiring managers to do so that they were focus less on um, you know, who's in the office and more on what are people uh, working on. As a result, we, we've actually had pretty great applicant pools. Um, I feel very lucky, and but I think part of it's also this work that we've done. Um, right now we have eight out of the 15 um, full-time permanent staff identify as people as BIPOC up from one out of 13 previously. So we just made really intentional efforts and it, and it worked. And I also encouraged all of the hiring managers and myself to really be out in the community and developing relationships so that it wasn't just you know waiting for people to come to us, but really being proactive in terms of um, how we show up. So they know our values, they know who we are and feel comfortable engaging with us. So yeah, it's been, it's been good so far. I want to work for you. Uh, other thoughts uh, or observations of how we've changed with your um, current or returning staff? I see a question in, in the chat that is flying. Um, Jeanette asks, I, and I'm paraphrasing here, what are the financial implications for your organization in bringing salaries up to pay bounds? I don't know that an absolute number is as meaningful as impact. 
you know, I, so I'll just speak to my experiences that um, when something's important, you do it and you figure out how to, that's my, that's what I feel. And so we just, we said, okay, if the, if these, if this is an important value, then we do it. And I did hear from people saying, you know what, that means you're going to have one less artist on the festival stage. That's an artist fee. And I said, well, this is the cost of doing business. Like we can't, we're not going to do this business on the backs of our employees making sacrifices so that we can have one more artist on the stage. Um, so we just, we were really transparent about that value and made sure to bring the board along in that conversation so that they understood when the, um, when the balance sheet looked a little different, that there was intentionality behind it, that it wasn't just growing for the sake of growth and it's unsustainable, but this is really about what the festival needs to do to be both competitive as well as, you know, I think morally right when it comes to paying, um, paying workers what they should be making. And I can add on that. Um, I'm a fiscally conservative uh, executive director. So the way that we build our budgets here at Utah Presents is to overestimate on expenses, sort of really put in as everything that we can imagine. And then what has happened in our pattern here is that because we do that, um, we get to the end of the fiscal year and generally we haven't spent quite as much as we projected to spend uh, because everyone is really good at cost saving. Uh, so then we end up with a surplus and we have utilized that surplus for all sorts of things like facility needs and we have done bonuses um, for staff. And I had to shift my thinking to recognize that Although that is really safe, that approach is really safe. It wasn't, um, what I wasn't doing was making sure that I was taking care of um, particularly our part-time employees. And that it was, it, and it is a difficult shift to make, but to shift my thinking to recognize that utilizing the resources um, instead of sitting on them, uh, but utilizing them in order to increase salaries was just as valuable as that uh, as that structure where we were ending up with savings at the end of each fiscal year. Mm -hmm. And to your to your point about um, adding value by spending down your accrued savings, um, Scott adds a question in the chat: um, How are folks managing the value of promoting versus hiring from without? Um, bearing in mind that the promoting from within can reinforce systemic bias. Is that, who would like to, to respond? Laura. I, I mean, I think that's so important. Uh, one of the, the threads of, um, as I've been, listening to what everyone's speaking about, I think personalization uh, is really important. And I think when it comes to promoting someone from within versus hiring from without, um, it, it falls in the same line of thinking, I think from a managerial or supervisory perspective of just not approaching a one size fits all. So what works uh, to promote someone in a role uh, in one area of your organization may not be the right thing uh, in another. I mentioned that we hired a new community engagement role. And I think that was one of those roles that it was important to bring someone from one of the communities that we need to do a better, more intentional job of intersecting with. Though recently we promoted from within with our director of ticketing. Uh, and I think that allowing there to be growth uh, for employees that have served the organization well, including through this weird, ever-changing pandemic, I think there's a lot of value in that. And I do think what we're finding is the staff that, that we've managed to retain through this challenging time see value in, in being able to individually plan for, for what they're doing with the organization, what their individual growth, growth plan might look like. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that's, that's sort of a wonderful intersection of um, organizational planning and career planning, because it, it stops being a job when someone can see their progression inside the organization, it starts being more of a career where you, you can acquire skill and make yourself an asset. Um, so I, I wanna do a quick time check because we have, have so much we want to accomplish and it's a really fast hour. Um, Krista, David, should we jump into our third big question? 
Yeah, maybe if we take the third question now and then we'll have time because there's so much uh, overlap where we're discovering the new questions as we try to answer the original ones. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, okay, so before we do that, I see a question, a comment from Hannah. Um, I feel like there's an unconscious bias in this conversation that blames workers for demanding better wages. Um, responding only for myself, Hannah, I hear you. And that's that's not new from COVID. That's without being crude, that's old news. Um, and it's not unique to the performing arts space at all. Um, if if I got three wishes, the first would be let's knock that off. Um, so I I don't know how to resolve that, but I want you to know that your your concern is shared. And I would just add, what I would add is wages are essential and we can't lose sight of the fact that uh, people need to be able to feel comfortable in what they're able to do financially. I think that benefits is also super important and organizationally we've tried to look at uh, how, how can we extend benefits that we've traditionally offered only to full-time staff to part-time staff too. Uh, makes a huge difference to people, especially as they're uh, planning for next steps in their life and, and what's important to them. Uh, again, I think it's about individualizing and customizing uh, your approach whenever possible. We have, uh, just for perspective, we have about 50 full-time staff and we have over 500 part-time staff and volunteered. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So almost infinite room for variation, complexity. Um, so this, this actually leads us sort of perfectly to this third question, uh, which I've just dropped in the chat. What changes do you dream of implementing and why? And how do you think these changes would respond to a values shift? Um, and I'll, I'll look to Brooke to start us off. Yeah, and I'm going to focus uh, in my comment about this uh, in answer to this question, specifically as a university presenter that's, you know, seated in a in an institution of higher education that has a robust college of fine arts that trains uh, the, the future you know, workers of the arts and cultural industry. And one of the things that I, and I, and I think someone actually already posted uh, in the comments about this, but one of the things that we're feeling acutely is a diminishing, and this was pre-pandemic, but it's exacerbated now with the pandemic, um, is diminishing pools of skilled technical labor. And that's from you know, the folks who are willing to work for us full-time as a production manager, as a lighting technician, as an audio technician, to the overhire that we need to execute shows. So you know, we do have an IATSE, a local IATSE stagehand union here, and we have a number of other um, non-unionized labor uh, suppliers. But the demand has grown in our marketplace dramatically with commercial content. Um, and the, the number of people, particularly joining the IATSE union, union has diminished. And so as I think about that issue, that, that very particular labor shortage, um, and then I think about our, you know, our presence on a university campus, I'm looking at our, uh, our institutions of higher education and who are they training and, and how. And, one of the things that I think is problematic in, in most arts programs is that the disciplines that relate to, to technical work are often lowest on the chain of, or on the hierarchy of value, right? So as an example here, you know, we have a theater program that its largest student enrollment and most of its investment goes into the musical theater program. Right, so those are the students who who are studying and training to to be performers, and then it's the actor training program, and it's very last is the technical training programs, and so we're not creating in in higher ed, we're not creating training systems uh, or curriculum programs that either signal value or train students to go out into the workforce and work as highly skilled technical labor. And also, as we all know, particularly for multidisciplinary presenters, the, the needs have changed also in the last 20 years. The technical needs of shows have gotten way more complicated. You know, it's a rare show now that doesn't have some sort of multimedia component. And so 
the, the technical skills that we need for the crew calls are also more complicated. And, and so those are two really acute problems that I'm thinking a lot about. So when I dream about the future, I dream about revising the way in which we educate our future arts workers so that we are actually building a pool of people who can step into those roles as opposed to seeing it diminish, 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 diminish and being devalued by the curriculum that's offered through institutions of education. Brooke, you're getting many people in agreement. Uh, also working at a university, I'm full agreement of, of the visibility and the valuing. Um, I'm also very mindful that universities continue, my own included, to increase tuition. And so is the university the best? Is it the only way to get this training for these technically qualified um, workforce? Um, so what are their other options do people have? And also what's visible? You know, when, when students look, they often see the most uh, celebrated positions or the highest paid celebrity positions and not necessarily all the positions or the median positions. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And I think even if we look at the um, standard engagement in APAP membership, how many, how many production managers do we see? How many technical directors do we see show up in these spaces? Um, and some of that's logistics, I understand that, um, you know, that's a struggle within my own organization is finding time in their days, which are so different than an administrator's day to engage in these conversations. But um, I think that's a good example. I also forgot to mention that, of course, you know, I'm in Salt Lake City, which is a, a mid-sized urban market, and it's a problem here. It's also a problem specifically to the West in that we aren't our, our definition of near cities is very different because we have big geographic empty spaces and mountain ranges between us. So if you're a technical worker in Salt Lake City, like it isn't easy for you to quick go sub in um, in, in Idaho because there's you, you have to drive far to get to other major markets. And then if you think about rural locations, that makes that's even harder that it's already been an issue, but it's getting even worse because again we're having diminishing uh, folks trained to work in these areas, but then they're also not not congregating and living in in rural parts of our country. So, so folks not in a direct. Um, presentation planning role, agents, managers, um, folks who perhaps work shoulder to shoulder with programmers. Can you chime in in the chat about how um, technical and production staffing concerns are impacting you or how you think they might going down the road? Again, I'm looking at agents and managers um, particularly because if, if the artists you represent have specific technical requirements, um, you know, what, what does it mean to know that a marketplace has consumers who want this content, but perhaps doesn't have a guarantee of the technical expertise to support its execution? Okay, you're all typing furiously again. I get it. <laughs> um, so a handful of minutes ahead of schedule, this is what happens when two recovering stage managers are involved in a session. Um, we have a, a sort of mid-session questionnaire that we think will help to um, bring more focus to the next part of this conversation at conference in January, or one of the next parts of this huge conversation that happens in January. Um, thank you. Um, I don't know how to pronounce your name, Raish? at Cadence Arts Network. Yeah. Um, <laughs> adaptation, Semper Gumby um, is a, a phrase I learned years ago and I, I repeat it to myself often. Um, so in a, in a couple of moments, David will drop a link in the chat. This is the first of two surveys that you'll get. So this survey is about sort of upvoting um, particular topics or bunches of topics that we can probe more deeply at a January session. Um, that link is now available. I also would like to uh, preemptively apologize if I missed any of your topics in chat as we've been going here. Um, please forgive me if I did not include yours. 
I included a, a write-in option as well. Um, so that link should be available in chat. I'm gonna post it again. Um, it uh, starts off with Elon, um, which is my host university, um, but this is a simple upvote, five of the dozen options of are there topics that you are particularly interested in. Oh, let me do that one more time. I'm getting one other note here. Uh, let's try it that way. Uh, hopefully that is a live link now for everyone. Uh, and so uh, if I did not capture the recommendation you made in chat or something we've been discussing, um, please uh, let me know. Um, or actually please just put it as the write-in topic not identified in this list. And all these topics can be either from your perspective, if you work for an organization, if you're joining us today as an artist um, or any other of the related fields within APAP. And hopefully folks have been able to see the link now. So Brooke asks a, a burning question. Um, if there will be another round of data gathering for return to the stage. Um, at this time, we're not planning to issue a new um, phase of the survey. Uh, this, this was conducted as a voluntary effort uh, that David and I cooked up in the first seven weeks of shutdowns in the US. Um, and we think that about two years is a sufficient amount of volunteer time for the initial research to be collected and synthesized and distributed to the field through conversations like this, sessions in person at conference, possibly wearing you know seven layers of masks. Um, and uh, it, in the event that you know someone who has resources to spare, I'm sure we could be convinced <laughs> to extend the study. Um, but not, at this time, we're not planning to craft and um, distribute a new survey. All right, so I, we've got 35 responses already. It looks like there's more in progress. Uh, so perhaps if there's other things from our panelists that we wanted to chat about today, I'll keep running this. And in uh, about maybe five more minutes, we'll share with you in full transparency what people are thinking about today. Um, also, we, we know that there are a number of sessions at conference that probably we're identifying that is already planned for conference. Um, so we'll also be able to kind of hopefully share what other resources exist for some of these topics. Shelly, Laura, and Brooke, any topics that we did not get to today that you're hoping we would? No. <laughs> I, <laughs> um, but I, I something is coming to mind as I'm kind of watching the chat um, go. And, you know, I think that um, one of the things I've been working to resist is either or thinking and instead and thinking. And uh, so especially when it's um, kind of put, budgets is an area where this is difficult because they are often finite in a given year. But I, I, you know, I just want to push back a little bit against the if we do this, if we do this thing that costs more money for staffing, it means we can't do this other thing, which is put great art on stage. And I, I don't perhaps that's true in a short you know, window of time. But I think the long game is that um, if we come from a, a lens of abundance, that we invest in things, it reaps benefit, we, we become uh, better organizations and we are able to creatively, part of our job as arts workers, I think, is to come up with creative solutions to how to both have equitable, smart, human-centered 
practices when it comes to staffing and organizational management and great art that attracts the audiences that we want to attract in our communities and on stages. And so, so I, I try to challenge myself and all of us to think about those things as, as not mutually exclusive, but as supportive of each other. I'll just type in, I think um, she's talking about it's like the uh, yes and uh, you're building on someone's Laura, idea. Laura, your you're breaking up. Can you maybe turn off your video so we can hear you? Sure. Can you hear me better now? <clears throat> I'll just add that the yes and philosophy is so important. And I think as we have to do all these different diverse ideas and new organizations to new levels and new uh, goals in terms of dreaming, Technology continues to be something I'm grappling with and the way that we can continue to animate and give voice to uh, artists that may be uh, virtual instead of on our stages. And that's such a uh, thinking about how to continue to support artists that may not be in our physical space is another thing that's on my head, so. I'm gonna now share out what we're getting as these first responses. It's still in progress. Um, so if you are still voting, your, your votes will be recorded. Uh, but just to give everyone a glimpse today of where we are, let me see if I can share this effectively uh, without giving away anyone's personal information. All right, so we should be seeing uh, a bar graph here. We're uh, seeing your and, desktop, my friend. Oh dear, okay, let's stop that and try once more. Um, how about this view? All right. See, we can make technology work for us. All right. Uh, I should also say that when you took this uh, questionnaire, all the responses were randomized. Just to make sure we weren't all taking the first five or six. That sound really great. Uh, so we're seeing, uh, a, you know, all of these are getting multiple votes. Uh, 35 people have already voted to, they want to discuss further increasing diversity in their organization. Uh, 31 for hybrid or flexible work options. Um, but again, we've, we're getting kind of a, a great range. Um, there are 10 write-in questions as well. Um, so we'll be taking a look at some of those. Uh, again, we just wanted to see what are, you know, if we could do this sort of breakout room at conference, what are the things that people really want to discuss? Um, or what do we feel like today was just the tip of the iceberg as we talk about uh, uh, wage transparency and investments in wages. So I will stop the share for now. So, so looking at that data, just as briefly as everyone did, and at the risk of being glib, um, we already have a pile of data that says there's been a shift in values, what we hold dear. Um, and what, what this room just asserted, I think very strongly, is that we're rethinking how we are valued. And unfortunately, in English, the word valued works over time almost every time it is uttered. Um, but I think it's appropriate in this case. So if you can drop in the chat, <laughs> thank you, Noah. <laughs> It's a valuable word. Uh, you know, you really just made my day. Um, so as you think about um, your responses to that survey, and, and by no means are we taking that as you know gospel, we know that stuff will come up because there are some holidays approaching, um, as well as the many holidays we just passed through. Uh, you know, new issues may arise, new themes may come to mind. Um, think about, and, and I'm sure that you know, the APAP team will hear from you about whether you want these to be um, areas of exploration, brainstorming type conversations at conference, or if you're really just looking for concrete tools and resources. Um, you know, if, if I can offer a local resource that I found very useful um, in the earliest days uh, after George Floyd's murder, um, the city of New Haven began to craft a toolkit uh, 
Arts for Anti-Racism, and it involves a pledge and a very practical, huge library of documents, guides, resources. Um, you know, they, there was plenty of community conversation, formally and informally, um, but ultimately what emerged was a need for concrete action steps and guides because people saw that they couldn't make it up as they went along. Um, so if the need from this conversation is concrete steps and guides, that would be a wonderful thing to communicate to the APAP team. Um, because both brainstorming and the, the toolkits have a valuable, ha, a valuable place in this big conversation going forward. And as we start to wrap things up here, I'm just gonna share in chat. Um, we wanna thank uh, Brooke and Shelly uh, and Laura for joining us this afternoon. Uh, I also wanna be able to turn things back to Krista. Uh, again, being stage managers, we wanna end this on time, um, but we're gonna be saving the chat. And as uh, Meg mentioned, you know, it's not just a matter of what topics also receive the most votes. We wanna make sure that everyone is heard. Um, and if there's other ways that we can provide resources. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, and back over to Krista. Great, thank you all. Um, thank you, Megan and David for your leadership here and to Shelley, Laura and Brooke, thank you so much for sharing your expertise and, and perspectives um, and everyone here, just really good points. Um, you know, to, Meg, to Megan David's point, this is uh, again, a way to sort of uplift um, the many issues that impact this workforce uh, challenge that we're facing. Um, and so we do have sessions at conference, primarily over the weekend um, in person that will also be shared out um, at the same time around hiring strategies, around hiring BIPOC um, uh, new, new, uh, new leaders uh, about um, the ways that we can rethink how we talk about competencies and just sort of the things that we maybe sometimes take for granted, you know, in our HR uh, work um, and rethinking the way that we, we talk about that work and the ways that we assess and measure um, uh, people's skills in that area. I think it's not everyone has a, a playbook yet, but we see this as a conversation for the field and hopefully a, a working group from the field to continue these conversations to really work through the problem um, because we, we're not finding that, um, you know, any, no one person has the answer, but collectively we can come up with some really great solutions for the field. And to your point, Jacob, thanks for bringing that up about the wage transparency. I know that we, we have advocated for this on a regular basis. Um, and certainly APEP has a role in helping to facilitate and encourage um, and model uh, ways of working. So, you know, thank you for that point. And um, and I think that's it uh, at 159. Thank you all so much for being here. Uh, please take our survey. If we can, uh, if our program staff can drop the survey around this session into the chat, we would appreciate um, you providing some input there. And we look forward to seeing you next month. And we look forward to seeing you, if you can join us for the next uh, field-wide conversation about the future of booking and touring and presenting and, and how convening plays a role in that. We'd love to have you there as well. So um, thank you and have, thank you, Willie. Uh, please take the survey, everybody. And uh, thank you so much. And we'll we hope you have a great afternoon or late morning, wherever you might be. <laughs>